The science of chance is old, very old. But it continues to weave a thread through all aspects of our lives. I will illustrate one aspect of the theory which has a particular resonance today. I'm going to take you from the sad story of a birthday cake to those phenomena which have become a part and parcel of the political discord of these times. Social isolation, masking, vaccine hesitancy, and pandemic. The story begins with a birthday. I won't tell you how long ago it was. But my children, young then, decided to bake their father a cake. And because he loves chocolate so, they added chocolate chips to it. Unfortunately, not enough chips were added for the volume of a cake. Anyone who has tried to estimate the number of pieces of candy in a candy jar can attest to how hard it is to estimate volumes. In any case, when the birthday boy cut gleefully into the cake, he discovered to his dismay that his slice contained not one chocolate chip. Disaster. <laughs> Worst birthday ever. <laughs> Having with admirable fortitude recovered from this crushing disaster, what would anyone do? Naturally, hunt through all the remaining slices to see if one had just been very unlucky. Suppose that 30 chocolate chips were scattered at the cake, and one were to cut up the cake into 30 slices and grub around inside them to see how many slices contained no chips. I'm not saying we did this, mind you. The resulting mess on the dining table gets one, to use a very technical phrase, into deep doo-doo with one's spouse. But here's what this experiment, purely conjectural, I make no admissions. We are having technical difficulties. Yeah. As I said, purely conjectural, I make no admissions. But here's what this experiment shows. If 30 chocolate chips are distributed in a cake and you cut it up into 30 slices, you will discover that approximately one-third of the slices contain no chips. Well, not really one-third. The actual answer is 1 over E, and the approximation gets better and better the more the chips and slices. So what is E? Don't take alarm. This is all the mathematical sophistication I'm going to need from you. E is a number. Not any old number, mind you. But one of the five fundamental numbers which hold up the whole universe. But no pressure. For our purposes, the reciprocal of E is approximately one-third, or if you want to be pernickety about it, about 0.37. Now, that's strange. Any time a fundamental mathematical constant appears out of thin air, one should surely wonder why. The answer dates back to the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution and a man named Poisson. Bear in mind that this was a time of the dawn of democracies, and fundamental to a democracy is the right to a trial by jury. But with the best will in the world, jurors can make mistakes. Innocents can be incarcerated. Guilty people may be set free. Life happens. Poisson got interested in the chance underpinnings of such miscarriages of justice, leading to questions such as, how large should a jury be? We can see the continued relevance of such questions today. Consider as a Gedanken or thought experiment that 10 jurors are selected from the veneer, the pool of potential jurors. 
I know, I know, there are 12 jurors, as we know from To Kill a Mockingbird. And if it makes you happier, consider 12 or 30, for that matter. But in round numbers, suppose 10 jurors are selected, and that jurors make errors one-tenth of the time. What fraction of jury trials result in no juror errors? Now, you guessed it. About one-third, or more precisely, one over E, as Poisson discovered. And what is the link? Juror errors, hopefully, are rare. The chocolate chips, sadly, were rare. <laughs> Poisson's law arises in the context of rare events. Now, examples fitting Poisson's law are ubiquitous, from chocolate chips to misprints in a book, to traffic accidents to the distribution of stars in the firmament, from the banal to the sublime, as it were. But let me give you just one pictorial example. This time, taken from the middle of the 20th century, at another time when the world was balanced on the brink of a precipice. War at any time and place is a barbarity. I could have picked any of the abominations from our history, but here is one such in the sad litany of human hubris and ambition. This montage of images shows the devastation visited upon London during the blitz of the Second World War. I could just as easily have shown you the Allied bombing of Dresden, or the continuing horror that is the devastation of Mariupol. About a decade ago, the bomb site project set about mapping every bomb that hit the larger London area. Approximately 30,000 bombs fell on London in this period. If one were to cut up London into approximately as many city blocks as there were bombs, then the chance that any particular bomb falls upon a particular city block, one in 30,000, is quite small. It is a rare event. If one were to think of bombs as chocolate chips and city blocks as cake slices, what you have on screen is a macabre birthday cake. And now it will not at all surprise you to learn that the distribution of bomb hits in London follows a quite amazing, macabre, but amazing fit to Poisson's law. In particular, the fraction of city blocks which had no bombs falling on them is, you guessed it, 1 over E. This is a political time, and a political time demands slogans, and here's one. Rare events are governed by Poisson's law. Now, rare does not mean inconsequential. Rare events can be very consequential. Think of Category 5 hurricanes, wars, financial collapses, birthday cakes. Well, perhaps that's not on the same level of gravity as the others, calamitous as it was. Pestilences and pandemics. And this brings us neatly to the 21st century and the world again balanced on the edge of a precipice. This time confronted by a pandemic originating in one part of it and spreading rapidly and inimically to all portions. To date, approximately 100 million people have been infected by COVID-19 in the United States alone. And these 100 million infections approximately have taken place over a concentrated period of approximately 100 weeks. In very rough terms, this means that there have been about a million infections per week. Of course, this ignores the actual ebb and flow of the dread disease. But bear with me while we get a feeling for the scale of the disaster. Now, a million infections in a population of 350 million means that on an individual basis, the chances of getting infected are quite small, only about three in a thousand. This is a rare event. Aha, I seem to recall an unfortunate birthday cake. 
Now, I do not mean to minimize the scale of this disaster. A million infections is a lot. At minimum, it's going to put hospitals under severe stress, and a surge will bring us to our knees. But on an individual basis, the chance of an individual being infected, like a particular chocolate chip falling into a particular slice, is small. And the behavior of the pandemic is going to be governed by Poisson's law. Now, of course, the pandemic is not static. Would that it were. It spreads virulently. So to get a feel for how community interactivity affects spread, consider that we have a community of 1,000 people and that on, on average, each individual interacts widely with seven others. The visualization on screen shows you quite dramatically the atypical connectivity that might emerge. Each dot represents a person, and what you see is remarkable. In a few short steps, everyone is connected to everyone else. For a disease that spreads as virulently as COVID-19, you can imagine the scale of the disaster. When the connectivity drops to just a little below seven, isolated individuals, hermits if you will, start to appear. Though the fraction of such communities which are fully connected is still about one third. Well, you know better, it's one over E. The point where hermits start getting absorbed into the larger connective is something that scales with the size of the population. Approximately just a bit below seven in a thousand, about 20 in a billion. It actually scales at a logarithm of the size of the population, but I did promise you no more mathematics. So back to the picture. When the connectivity drops further below seven, more and more isolated individuals, hermits, and small cliques start to appear. And for example, when the connectivity hits 1.5, you see the picture on the bottom left of the screen. A lot of isolated individuals, small cliques, but there's still one large connected sub-community. And of course, the infection can spread rapidly and uncontained in that group. Now, what happens? More technical problems, I'm afraid. Now, what happens if connectivity drops just a smidgen more to 0.5? And now a dramatically different picture appears on the top left of your screen. Suddenly, the entire population is segregated into small groups and cliques. The spread of infection is stymied as the groups are not connected to each other. The pandemic vanishes quietly like the snows of yesteryear. And where is that magic connectivity, where this magic happens? Precisely at one. As the connectivity from just above one, when you have a large connected subgroup, drops to just below one, the large group fractures into small cliques and subgroups. Above one, the pandemic spreads violently. Below one, it dies. You may find this remarkable, as my students have frequently had occasion to tell me. Math rocks. So this is what the discoveries arising from Poisson tell us. If we can manage a rate of infection passage just less than one, this will quickly quench the pandemic. We have not been very successful in the effort. So what can we do? And this brings us to policy. How does one reduce interconnectivity? And there you have it. Social isolation and masking on one hand, vaccinations on the other. The former reduces interactions. The latter reduces passage of infection when there are interactions. Together, they create a connectivity graph where the edges representing passages of infection are now reduced. 
these are the tools available to an epidemiologist. And the underlying mathematical models and ideas going back to Poisson tell us exactly what the target is. Now, of course, there's more to social policy than the epidemiological imperative. One can surely discuss the economic, educational, and emotional aspects of policy and debate the fraught balance between individual rights and social responsibility. But what one should not do is promulgate disinformation or outright misinformation. If that is done for political purposes, that is reprehensible. But if it happens because of a collective lack of exposure to quantitative ideas or even interest in them, then that is not only deeply regrettable in the 21st century, that could be fatal. If I were to leave you with anything meaningful at all, it is this. On the necessity of a modicum of quantitative thought in all aspects of our lives, a soupçon of mathematical thinking will allow us to bring clarity to a dim and murky world as we navigate the shoals of a troubled century. Vive Monsieur Poisson.